Chemotherapy exposure during the first trimester is contraindicated and increases the risk of spontaneous abortion, fetal death, and major congenital malformations. The estimated incidence for major malformations during the first trimester is 10 to 20%, and second and third trimester exposure may affect some body systems still developing and can still result in fetal growth restriction, low birth weight, and preterm labor. Yet, I do want to stress that pregnancy can remain a possibility. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Manager of Oncology Nursing Practice at ONS. And today we're talking with Kelsey Miller, Clinical Nurse Specialist in Oncology and Infusion Therapy at Reading Hospital in West Reading, Pennsylvania, about pregnancy testing policies and procedures in cancer care. As a reminder, you can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks so much for joining us today, Kelsey. Thanks for having me. So let's start out with just discussing why is it important to standardize screening for certain patients to screen for pregnancy prior to beginning their cancer treatment? It's really crucial to identify prior to treatment as this should be considered a patient safety never event. We know that exposure to chemotherapy or radiation can cause mutagenic changes in reproductive cells and teratogenic effects in a developing fetus. Women of childbearing potential should have a documented pregnancy test prior to beginning cancer treatment due to the adverse effects of chemotherapy and radiation on a developing fetus. This is also supported by the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. And to date, there is no standard of practice for the schedule of retesting after treatment has been initiated. And we know that an unintended pregnancy during cancer treatment may result in delay in therapy teratogenic exposure and cause increases in general health risks and limit treatment options for our patients. Thank you for that. Can we talk a little bit more detail just about the dangers of cancer treatment during pregnancy? Yeah, when I think cancer treatment, I think of three main categories, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Chemotherapy exposure during the first trimester is contraindicated and increases the risk of spontaneous abortion, fetal death, and major congenital malformations, and direct effects of tumor can sometimes confound the risk of fetal loss. The estimated incidence for major malformations during the first trimester is 10 to 20%, and second and third trimester exposure may affect some body systems still developing and can still result in fetal growth restriction, low birth weight, and preterm labor. Yet, I do want to stress that pregnancy can remain a possibility. Certain targeted immunotherapy agents can also cause birth defects, and I would um, encourage listeners to refer to package inserts for specifics. Radiation is contraindicated during pregnancy by NCCN guidelines. There's rare cases where a low therapeutic dose may be used with uterine shielding, but radiation is known to cause fetal malformations and intellectual disabilities, and birth outcomes in women previously treated with radiation demonstrate low birth weight, preterm delivery, stillbirth, and death. And lastly, surgery remains a possibility throughout pregnancy. Typically, they'll wait till a second trimester for abdominal surgery. Thank you for explaining that. It's one of those things where like we all just know and assume it would be bad to give these treatments during pregnancy, but I think it is important to really dig into those details a little bit. Talk to me about the criteria for pregnancy testing for someone who is undergoing ca- uh, cancer care. Yes, yeah, so I recommend using ASCO guidelines, which state reproductive age for women are 18 to 50. However, at our institution, we partner with our internal specialists. And with the average age of menopause being 50 to 51, we chose to err on the side of caution and we treat adult patients. So our inclusion criteria were women aged 18 to 50 without exclusionary criteria. And ASCO does allow exclusionary criteria to be institution-specific. At our institution, we define that as a total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, history of whole pelvic radiation, or 50 years without menses for 12 consecutive months. 
And our internal specialists did encourage that if the patient's less than 50 with no menses, they should assess for premature ovarian failure. Thank you. I think that's really helpful to have some of those objective criteria to consider. And I think what we know is that, unfortunately, we're seeing patients get diagnosed younger. This, you know, I think for a while, right or wrong, I think this was always just sort of in in the back of people's minds because, oh, well, well, our patients are typically elderly. And so we don't need to really worry about that. But we're seeing that that tide is unfortunately shifting. So I think this is a really important conversation. Kelsey, can you talk to me or do you have an example you can share of how you have observed that pregnancy testing has really impacted a patient's cancer treatment? Yeah, unfortunately, we recently had a 40-year-old female who presented to the emergency department with abdominal pain. And the ED always builds into the workflow that pregnancy could be a possibility. And, you know, this patient did state that she was sexually active. They did a pregnancy test and it came back negative. Further diagnostic workup, they did a CAT scan and pelvic ultrasound, which revealed a complex cystic mass that was suspicious for ovarian cancer. So this patient was discharged with follow-up from our our gynoc providers in a week. And at that outpatient visit, the patient was agreeable to the suggested operative intervention being a robotic removal of the mass and possible total hysterectomy and some lymph node sampling. So surgery was scheduled three weeks later in which the pregnancy test came back positive. So surgery had to be postponed. And I'm just grateful that our surgery center does have a great process in place where pregnancy testing prior to surgery is the standard of care. So for this patient in particular, she had to follow up with a pelvic ultrasound and HCG testing, which did reveal a gestational sac, but unfortunately patient did have a miscarriage. I think this story, though, does speak to the importance of screening for pregnancy throughout cancer treatment as this patient's pregnancy result changed within three weeks. That is just a great example to show how it is important to have those processes hardwired in all the areas of cancer care that you described, that you know that risk exists in all of those areas. And for important reasons, they has to be hardwired into the process. And so policies and procedures are the typical way that we do that in healthcare. Can you talk to me a little bit about just the notion? We know that no test really is perfect. There's always risks for false positive, false negative. Talk to me a little bit about What happens? Can a patient get a false positive in this situation? What would lead to that false positive? And what should nurses or our healthcare providers do to make sure that the results that we're working with are accurate? Yeah. So this also popped up, you know, if you screen, you're going to find these nuances. So since screening, we've had three positive serum qualitative tests that prompted a need for the serum beta HCG test. And two of these patients were breast cancer patients. Per the package, insert for these pregnancy tests, there may be a number of conditions other than pregnancy that may cause elevated levels of HCG. And this may include trophoblastic disease, testicular tumors, prostate cancer, breast and lung cancer. And then also certain medications can also cause elevated levels of HCG. I suggest partnering with the lab for method comparison of their testing. However, there's not an established criteria to identify these patients up front that may have persistently low serum HCGs. So it is best to continue to screen and have the physician evaluate the test result in conjunction with the patient's medical history, physical exam, and other test results. Thank you for sharing that. I think that is important. Just understanding, not reacting immediately or overreacting, I guess, to a, the initial result that there um, are steps to take that you confirm that result and then maybe uncover what else could be driving the results that we see. I think those are always prudent steps to take. And also that would, of course, impact our patient education if and when that positive result does come. So I think those are important things to keep in mind. So at your institution, you were part of a team that helped implement a standardized process for pregnancy testing and fertility preservation using your electronic health record. Can you give us maybe a snapshot of what that program looked like and how that process unfolded? So we had a fertility risk checklist that was based off ASCO standards that was not fully operationalized nor built into physician workflows. The checklist was a way of documenting that risks of infertility, fertility preservation, and contraception was discussed, as well as an attestation that referral to a reproductive endocrinologist was made if needed. I had a physician partner at the time who said the only way to get the providers to fill out this checklist is to make it a hard stop. So that's what we did. 
the fertility risk checklist is now a hard stop by means of an order validation that will pop up when the provider goes to sign the oncology treatment plan. And it'll say orders cannot be signed unless the fertility risk checklist is complete. It is intuitive in which it's an order validation. So it'll only populate for patients age 18 to 50 who do not have that checklist completed. And I partnered with the physicians. There was clear communication and a tip sheet prior to going live. So it wasn't impeding their workflows. And since then, I track compliance data quarterly via an oncofertility report that is internally built. And so far, we have 100% process reliability now with using this hard stop. In addition to that, we felt like that was the first step in documenting these discussions. But now that that is live, we have a pregnancy screen order group that automatically adds a pregnancy screen to oncology treatment plans for women age 18 to 50 who do not meet exclusionary criteria documented in that fertility risk checklist. Since there's no standard for frequency of retesting, our team decided to place pregnancy screens in the treatment plans up to weekly. And this past quarter, we had 100% compliance with pregnancy screening on 12 eligible women prior to active cancer treatment. I'm actually really glad that you brought up the frequency of testing because I know in my own practice, that was something that we felt there wasn't clear guidance on of, of, do you do it just before the initial start of treatment plan? Do you do it each cycle? If it's a weekly regimen, do you do it every week? And so it sounds like in your institution, you landed on just giving that, giving those options, making them available potentially every week to meet that frequency. But I think that's an important part that institutions, barring any other evidence that shows up or guidance that is more clear in that direction, that is one sticking point that I think individual institutions have to sort of grapple with. Yeah, and I definitely give credit to ONS communities. We looked back and saw what some other organizations were doing since we don't have guidelines to tell us what that standard should be. Absolutely. Just to double back, I also appreciate and smiled when you said that it was basically a hard stop in the electronic health record and just recognizing that if you make anything in the electronic record, knowing there's so many clicks and that's a whole nother discussion, but if you don't make it required, then it ultimately will get skipped. And so I think that is an important, you know, maybe eventually it won't have to be a hard stop because it becomes part of the expectation and the culture and it becomes hardwired in in the process and not necessarily the buttons that you click. But I recognize and I do applaud recognizing that we'll never get there if we don't start here by forcing it to be a requirement and a hard stop. And I think that's a, a unique way to use your electronic health record to really start to elevate and bring emphasis and bring attention to these important practice changes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about how our healthcare professional team can collaborate to effectively implement this type of standardized pregnancy testing in their practice. Yeah, so absolutely an interdisciplinary team approach is needed. We talked about the hard stop never would have gone to fruition if I didn't have a physician champion to help drive those practices. And whenever I develop teams, I like to share a common vision. We're all here for patient safety and we want to do preventable harm by pregnancy screening these patients that could potentially become pregnant during cancer treatment. Also using information systems to build into standardized workflows. So that takes partnership with your IT department and analysts and not letting unclear referral pass to a reproductive specialist be a barrier. Really want to encourage you to build that electronically. And then again, having policies and procedures to support your practice. I love that. I think a huge part of that is in empowering nurses to stand their ground. If there are certain things that need to be, if they can't be hard stops, which I know sometimes there's pushback from creating too many hard stops in that process. But if it can't be that, then I think nurses need to feel empowered to understand what the process and the policy states should happen and not be afraid to reinforce that. And if it requires ongoing discussions with the physicians just to communicate the policy and the importance of the process. I think that nurses just need to feel that support from their leaders to make sure that the process is followed, as you said, because the point of all this is patient safety. Yes. So what type of education about pregnancy testing do oncology nurses need to provide their patients and their families, you know, the right information before initiating treatment? 
Well, you just stated that, that nurses should be informed of our institutional policies and procedures to help guide their care. You know, they need to be aware of the appropriate and inappropriate exclusionary criteria and able to address if pregnancy screening is missing and therefore advocate for appropriate referrals. And that's just what our nurses are doing. You know, if they're, they're starting to recognize, you know, if a physician removed it from the treatment plan, they're reaching out to me and questioning it or reaching out to our pharmacy colleagues. So they're just doing a great job of advocating for the patient. And it's also just really important to make part of the nurse's standardized workflow and order set, which is why we chose serum rather than a urine qualitative pregnancy test, because nurses are obtaining that routine lab work. And we found there was not a delay in turnaround time between the two when factoring in nurses were also waiting for, say, like a CBC with differential to result. I think that's great. Trying to make that more efficient, remove what barriers are there so that from all of the care team's perspective, things can become as streamlined as possible. So that sounds like your team did a great job. So Kelsey, as we get to the end of our episode, we do like to always run through sort of a quick fire series of questions just to help summarize the discussion that we've had today. So to start that off, how do you think healthcare professionals can and should evaluate their hidden or implicit bias about pregnancy testing in oncology care? I think the first component is self-analysis and identifying one's own personal discomfort in discussing pregnancy screening and sexual health. Our policies, procedures do help make the processes more objective. And we know that process reliability will fail at the clinicians using subjective criteria to not order pregnancy screening. For example, some deviations from pregnancy screening when patients truly did meet criteria that I've encountered through chart reviews and nursing report is patients stating they already have children, partner has a vasectomy, or patient reports of abstinence, all of which are subjective that we're trying to move away from. There are also maybe some implicit biases related to patient financials and cost of treatment, cancer treatment outcomes if You were to delay for fertility preservation and then also unfamiliar or access to a fertility clinic. And all this may be a knowledge deficit as there's many resources available to assist with cost and access to care. I think those are all really important things that you brought up. The one thing I might add is that we should never approach a patient and make assumptions on, for example, if we have transgender patients and trying to reconcile what testing is appropriate based on the risks, you know, the biological risks that are there. And so I think those are important things to consider if your patients are transgender of how this process would impact them. And so while today's episode was mainly focused on sort of the logistics and the procedural way that we can roll out this type of regimented testing, I do think it is important to consider, as you mentioned in your response, the conversation that has to happen to discuss why this is necessary and why it's important. And that can be challenging for some nurses if they are the ones trying to explain maybe the routine testing that is done before all treatments. And so I'm glad that you brought those points up for discussion. What are some common misconceptions about pregnancy testing in cancer care? I would say many women with cancer are capable of conceiving. There's a misconception that all cancer therapy will render patients infertile, and this is not the case. Even though chemotherapy and radiation reduce fertility and may cause premature ovarian failure, many patients still remain fertile. And we know from research that physical intimacy remains important during cancer treatment and unintended pregnancies may occur. What additional training or education do oncology nurses need to stay current on this topic? I think oncology nurses need introductory training and ongoing education to support patient care needs, such as grand rounds and lunch and learns. Resources do need to be readily available and also for patient education, and a lot of that already exists. I would encourage oncology nurses to explore their own biases and attitudes towards this topic, and there's many educational opportunities for self-learning through the Oncology Nursing Society podcasts and journal articles, as well as other nonprofit organizations. And training really needs to include discussion tools to enhance nurses' sexual health communication early and often with patients. I could not agree more. I think it's so important. And it is truly, as you alluded to in explaining your 
institutions process. This is a part of a continuum of fertility, reproductive health, sexual health, of just this all kind of happens in that same space. This discussion is ongoing. And so I think, as you mentioned, having those discussion tools available to help nurses and all healthcare providers kind of have these conversations confidently, I think I agree with you completely, are very important. What are some additional resources for patients or other healthcare providers who might want to learn more? I would say look at ASCO and NCCN guidelines. There's many journal articles on not only pregnancy screening, but oncofertility in general. And the Oncology Nurses Society has many great resources available. And also what I just took was an enriching communication skills for health professionals in oncofertility. The acronym is ECHO, and it was a web-based training that included many skill building modules to help oncology health professionals communicate timely and relevant information regarding reproductive health to their AYA patients. So it was a course that you had to apply for, but luckily I was chosen and just had a wonderful experience learning all about oncofertility. That's really exciting and great to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Well, Kelsey, thank you again for coming on, sharing the success that your institution had in implementing the pregnancy screening as part of a routine process. Do you have any other information or final comments to share with our listeners today? Yeah, I would just encourage other organizations that do not have a standard for pregnancy screening to start with some chart reviews to get baseline data and then use that to support becoming compliant with ASCO guidelines. And I do stress that we need studies addressing frequency of screening after treatment has begun as women may be sexually active throughout cancer treatment and are at risk for unintended pregnancy. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.